Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at Noon starts now. The first person charged in Michigan's investigation of sex abuse in the Boy Scouts goes before a judge. And that does top our news this noon. Thank you for joining us. Mark Chapman is facing 10 counts of criminal sexual conduct. Prosecutors say that he sexually assaulted two boys when he was the scoutmaster in Roseville. He is the first to be arraigned since Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel launched a wide ranging investigation into past abuses. Priya Mann joins us now live. Priya, what more can you tell us? Well, Rhonda, this is just a horrific case. Mark Chapman appeared via video link before a judge here at 39th District Court accused of sexually assaulting two boys and there may be a third victim. Let's get to that new video just into our newsroom. The former Boy Scouts of America Scoutmaster worked at a church in Roseville where his scout troops sometimes met. 51 year old Mark Chapman is now facing several new charges of sex crimes against children. A victim identified Chapman as a predator in a call to the AG's Boy Scout sex abuse tip line. That alleged victim says the abuse started in the early 2000s when he was just 13 and continued till he was 17. Prosecutors say another victim is a family member and that he came forward after being physically assaulted. That alleged victim says Chapman started sexually abusing him when he was just 11 years old. Now Chapman was paroled earlier this month after serving nine years in a New York prison for unrelated sex crimes and was released directly into the custody of Michigan authorities. The assistant AG says Chapman's wife had tried contacting one of the alleged victims by sending a Facebook friend request. Take a listen to what she had to say. There is additional a third other ex witness who has come forward stating that Mr. Chapman has also sexually assaulted him. Uh, Mr. Chapman also made some recorded admissions in the state of New York to assaulting one of the charged victims, also admitting, which is the relevancy here to Michigan, that he started that abuse on that related victim here in the state of Michigan when that victim was under the age of 13 years old, which is uh, part of the related facts of one of the charge cases here. And again, two victims have come forward. There could be a third or even more prosecutors and police are looking into other potential alleged crimes committed by Chapman. The judge denied his bond. He will be back here in court next month. Reporting live in Roseville, I'm Priya Mann, Local 4. All right, Priya, thank you. Also making headlines, testimony back underway this morning in the trial of four men charged with plotting to kidnap Governor Whitmer and an undercover, undercover agent known as Red took the stand today. Let's get to Sean Lay. He joins us now live with more on what went on inside of the courtroom as this trial resumed for this week. Sean. Good afternoon, Rhonda. Great to see you. Good afternoon, everyone. You hit the nail on the head. We continue to pinpoint what happens inside the courtroom during this incredible trial each and every day because new information continues to come out each and every day. Today was no different. This is the start of week number three of the trial, uh, the plot to allegedly kidnap Governor Whitmer. It's day 11 on the witness stand. That FBI informant who was with this group of Wolverine watchmen known as Red, as you said, and he was the explosives expert for this crew and was testifying against against the men this morning. Here's what happened. Week three of the Whitmer kidnapping trial began early Monday, taking us inside key moments of the alleged plot. An undercover FBI informant taking the witness stand this morning. He was known by the name Red. He was with defendants Adam Fox and Barry Croft, at times with Daniel Harris and Brandon Concerta for a trip to Elk Rapids in the summer of 2020. And the informant recorded conversations that were had inside his truck as he drove them around the Elk Rapids area. This morning, the informant testified that defendant Barry Croft allegedly wanted to use napalm, a military grade, highly flammable substance to burn Governor Whitmer's summer home in Elk Rapids during a siege on her home in an effort to kidnap her. The informant testified defendant Adam Fox was allegedly intent on buying explosives for the attack and was attempting to buy $4,000 worth of explosives, but didn't have the money and asked if he could have the explosives on credit. Also, Red says they took secret trips to surveil the governor's summer home and take photos and continue to plan. But members of the group believed they were going to commit the kidnapping at that very time. Prosecutors asked the informant who told the group that the kidnapping was not going to happen at that time. The informant testified that he told the men they were not attacking at that very moment. 
Lots more, though, happening right now. That same FBI witness, again, Rhonda, say, is on the witness stand in federal court in Grand Rapids. But the defense attorneys for the four men charged in this are questioning him now. What's coming up now is what kind of training he was giving these men, what kind of government or military style equipment that he was providing the men with. So just how far he was going with them as they were allegedly plotting to kidnap the governor. So we're listening to every word of this, much more starting at 5 o'clock. Back to you. Well, each and every day, these testimonies are pretty eye-opening and very, very troubling. Sean, thank you. The wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas may be questioned by the House Select Committee that is investigating the January 6th insurrection. This is according to numerous sources. This comes after it was revealed that Virginia, known as Ginny Thomas, sent more than two dozen text messages to then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows. She reportedly asked Meadows to keep fighting to overturn the 2020 presidential election. Thomas is a conservative activist who recently said she attended a pro-Trump rally prior to the January 6th siege on the U.S. Capitol. And we want to turn now our attention to the war in Ukraine. President Zelensky says that Ukraine is prepared to discuss adopting a neutral status as part of a peace deal. But he says that it would have to go to a referendum and be guaranteed by third parties. Ukraine's leader also said that he would not sacrifice his country's territorial integrity ahead of a new round of peace talks with Russia that is set to take place this week in Turkey. Meantime, the Kremlin offered little hope for an imminent end to this devastating conflict with Moscow's military growing more focus on defeating Kyiv's forces in the east and fears rising that it may try to split the country in two. If it succeeds, Richard Engel has this report from eastern Ukraine. So we are on the edge of Kharkiv right now, and there's been some Russian shelling in this area overnight and into this morning. We've also heard outgoing fire, some small arms fire. So there are now once again battles in this city as the Russian military offensive, according to Russian officials, is shifting toward the east. It does not mean that Russia has given up its objective of taking over Kyiv, but the Russian military offensive around the capital had been stalled with you Ukrainian fighters pushing back some of the Russian troops. So now it seems that Russian forces are consolidating their firepower here in the east and around the city of Mariupol, which is in the southeast. Ukraine's President Zelensky, in an interview with the Russian opposition media, offered to give up uh, Mariupol. He told uh, commanders in the region, in the city, that it is up to their discretion now. If they want to leave in order to save their own lives, they can make that battlefield decision. But he said the commanders refuse to leave the city. They are still holding on, despite the fact that they are surrounded. Peace talks are expected to resume in Istanbul tomorrow, but Ukrainian officials say they are not hopeful. Just so devastating. That's Richard Engel reporting, doing an amazing job giving us reports from that part of the world, from eastern Ukraine. Be sure to stay with us here on Local 4 News and click on Detroit.com. We'll keep you updated with all the latest new information on the war in Ukraine as new information comes into my, our newsroom. We keep you updated online as well. We do want to turn our attention to today's forecast, which if you are ready for spring-like weather, you are not enjoying how cold it is. As we take a live look outside of uh, blue skies and just a couple puffy clouds, well, that sure doesn't tell the story, Brandon. The wind is dragging in more clouds and creating wind chills and throwing down a few flakes. And you know what? For the... Uh Sorry, a microphone fell on me. For the uh, end of January, all in all, not... Oh, it's March. Sorry about that. This is very unusual stuff. Not completely rare, but low middle 20s out there with a gusty wind. So wind chills still single digits and teens here at noon. That's what we're dressing for as we head out. There have been some flakes of flying right now. The worst of it is over in southern Ontario for anybody driving toward London, maybe toward uh, Toronto, we have to deal with some of those snow bands. The rest of us, it's clouds with a little bit of sun becoming a little more sun and a little less cloud cover late afternoon, but it stays on the cool side today. And tomorrow, we're tracking a storm and a warm up. Rhonda, coming up. 
All right, thank you, Brandon. Governor Gretchen Whitmer kicks off Building Michigan Together Week. The governor was in St. Clair Shores this morning to discuss a new infrastructure bill that was just passed by Michigan lawmakers. The Building Michigan Together plan will invest nearly $5 billion to fix roads, upgrade water pipes, and make high-speed internet more accessible. Now this is a fiscally responsible plan to make some of the largest investments in Michigan infrastructure in our history. Building on the work that we have done to fix roads and upgrade pipes, replace dams, and so much more. And Kim DeGiulio is there with the governor and she will have much more detail on the plan on her live report beginning at 5 p.m. this evening. President Biden proposes a $5.8 trillion budget that aims to bolster EVs, the Great Lakes, and increase military and police spending. The president also proposing a new minimum tax on wealthy households in the 2023 budget. The billionaire minimum income tax plan would impose a 20% minimum tax rate on households worth more than $100 million. According to the White House, if the plan is enacted, the tax would reduce the deficit by about $360 billion over the next decade. The White House says that the new budget would also propose targeted investments designed to increase economic growth and create jobs. It says a lot about the number of multimillionaires there are out there if it can raise that much money. So to come, the Biden administration is expected to give Americans over 50 the option to get a second COVID booster shot, a fourth shot, if you will. What you need to know, coming up.